Today, uh, Stephen Marsha is going to speak to us under the title The Overpopulation Myth, which you will be as aware of as I am, is uh, propounded over and over and over again, speculative numbers. You know, the world is on its way to hell in a handcart uh, because of the overpopulation here, there, and everywhere. Uh, and I was reminded of a remark I think attributed to the late Dr. Joseph Goebbels, who was the head of the propaganda ministry in the Nazi regime. I think it was he who said that if you repeat a lie often enough, people will accept that as a fact. You don't need my word for that, just watch the media. Ladies and gentlemen, to talk to us about the overpopulation myth, Dr. Stephen Mosher. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I think you'll agree this has been a wonderful conference so far. I've enjoyed the other speakers, and of course, I always enjoy being here in New Zealand. And traveling around New Zealand, as I have, and of course, I'll be continuing after this conference down to Wellington and Christchurch in Queenstown, I'm struck by how beautiful. New Zealand is, but also how empty it is, how few people there are. Which brings me to my topic today. Is New Zealand overpopulated? Would New Zealand be better off if there were fewer people on the North and South Island? Or would it be better off if there were more people, more young people, more babies being born, more producers, more consumers? Of course, there are other ways to put the question as well. Are the Mosiers, that is to say my wife Bear and I, as the parents of nine children, are we contributing to the overpopulation problem? Or are we part of the solution to the looming problem of depopulation? Well, of course, the answer of China's masters, as I think I made clear yesterday, would be the latter. In fact, I like to joke that the Chinese Communist Party has orders to sterilize me on site because I'm well over my quota of one child. Now to answer this question, I'm gonna show you a series of short YouTube videos up on the screen here that we have done at the Population Research Institute. We've done them to reach young people around the world and I think we're succeeding. These YouTube videos have now well over a million views. So let's start with the first one. It'll take about two minutes each and then we'll talk about them. The myth of overpopulation originated in England in 1798 when a vicar named Thomas Malthus, who fancied himself something of a mathematician, saw that food production increased incrementally, but people reproduced exponentially. He sat down and did some simple math, and summarily decided that the world would be out of food by 1890. He blamed reduced mortality rates, and recommended killing off the have-nots of society, lest the haves starve to death. This cry was taken up by Paul Ehrlich of Stanford University in 1968, who claimed that reckless human reproduction had overwhelmed the Earth. Massive famines would result, which would destroy, best case scenario, one-fifth of humanity by the end of the 70s. And the planet would follow. This fear produced large donations for the newly created UNFPA, which thrives on an imagined crisis that has been both imminent and rescheduled again and again over the past two centuries. The truth of the matter is that every family on this planet could have a house, with a yard, and all live together on a landmass the size of Texas, which is really just a small corner of the planet. The population of Earth will peak in 30 years, and then start to go back down. We're not overpopulated. Do the math. Now you've all heard that the world is overpopulated. You've read it in school textbooks, you've heard it on the radio, you've seen it on television, uh, you have uh, encountered it in the newspapers. This myth has been around for a long time and it has infected the thinking of lots and lots of people. It began in the United States, I'm sad to say, my own country, because we were and remain the principal funders of the UN Population Fund, which is the global population control agency that even today is funding China's one-child policy with its forced abortions and sterilizations. 
It's funding the population control program in North Korea where people are starving to death and the government is blaming their, their, their population for having babies. They're funding the Vietnamese two-child policy. They're funding policies in Africa, Asia, and Latin America to reduce the number of babies born. Paul Ehrlich, my former colleague at Stanford University, was one of the ideological fathers of this idea. He wrote a book, of course, The Population Bomb in 1968, the opening sentence of which reads, the battle to feed humanity is over. Hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in the 1970s. Now, I know that some of you, like myself, remember the 1970s, and you will recall that hundreds of millions of people did not starve to death in that decade. Of course, you would expect then Paul Ehrlich to say, I was wrong, I'm sorry, please forgive me, which is what I teach my children to say. But apparently, being a Stanford academic means never having to say you're sorry. Because he didn't apologize for being wrong, instead he wrote another book in the 1970s called The Population Explosion, the first one was the population bomb. The second book was the population explosion in which he predicted hundreds of millions of people would starve to death in the 1980s, pushing back apocalypse by 10 years. And so it goes. Let's go on to the next uh, video, poverty. When human beings first showed up on this planet, there weren't very many of us. And we faced a hard life of meeting our basic needs. Chances are, early humans spent a good deal of time hungry, cold, and without shelter. That is to say, poor. According to the World Bank, poverty is when people are deprived of well-being as a result of low income and aren't able to get the basic goods that they need for survival with dignity. How did any of the human race advance beyond poverty? We kept multiplying and we formed communities. In communities, people stop spending all their time on simple survival and are able to do things like divide up tasks, share resources, and pool their mental energies to come up with creative solutions to problems. These communities started with families, then grew into extended families, entire tribes, and then finally cities and nations. So what effect has this growth had on poverty? According to demographers, a very good one. In fact, history shows that as our numbers have grown, so has our average standard of living. Scientists measure this standard in everything from per capita income the average amount of calories consumed, even average height. And all of these averages have been increasing. Even though poverty still exists, the percentage of poor people has actually decreased as population has grown. The reason for this is that human beings are not simply consumers, we are producers. This is why, over the ages, we have learned how to do things like produce more food on less land, find better energy sources, and make sure that more people have enough to eat and a roof over their heads. And this is also why, though urban poverty is still a huge problem, statistics show that the poor who move to large communities actually have better chances of rising from poverty than they did in areas where there were fewer jobs and less opportunity. For this reason, poverty is a problem that is not solved by eliminating people. Poverty has always been a problem, even when there were scarcely any people on the entire planet. People are the only proven way out of poverty. Removing them will only leave the poor right where they started. Think about it. So the myth of overpopulation has led to a war on the poor because the idea of people like Paul Ehrlich, the idea that drives the UN Population Fund and my own country's foreign aid agency is that you can eliminate the poor, you can eliminate poverty by eliminating the poor and their children. Now we know that's wrong. It's wrong not just in a moral sense because these programs force women to accept sterilization, contraception, even abortion. These programs involve massive human rights violations in countries like China. They also undermine primary health care, taking resources away from treating infectious disease and putting them into population control programs so that people die unnecessarily, unnecessarily, of yellow fever and typhus and typhoid. And they make no sense in a world of falling birth rates, and yet we continue this attack on the poor. We know how to end poverty, and it's not by reducing the number of children born to the poor. What you need is property rights, the rule of law, an end to corruption, limited government, a free, free freedom of speech, freedom of association, uh, uh, freedom of assembly, uh, freedom of the press, and those kinds of things 
together will enable an economic takeoff that we've seen in country after country around the world. Some people will say that's all well and good, but isn't there a shortage of food? Let's watch the next video and see. According to believers in overpopulation, there are so many of us on the planet that food production cannot possibly keep up. However, according to both the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization and the World Food Program, there is currently enough food on the planet for everyone to be well fed. Not only that, but we're growing this food on less land than we did in the past. This is why in the United States, for example, the government can afford to pay farmers not to grow food, but instead return their farmland to the wild. Modern technology also allows us to grow food on land where it would have been impossible to do so, even a few years ago. Agricultural experts even believe that Africa, if cultivated using modern farming methods, could eventually feed the whole world, all by itself. Then why are people in many parts of the world starving? The World Food Program lists key causes of hunger, and overpopulation is not on that list. War, one of the leading causes of world hunger, destroys crops and disrupts relief efforts. Widespread poverty prevents many from buying the food that they need. And a lack of infrastructure means that there isn't a reliable way to transport food to areas that need it. This is why reducing the number of hungry people will not make the remaining people less hungry. Those who have access to the food will continue to have access to it, and those who don't will still be hungry. Reducing population will not magically cause food to be spread around equally. And blaming overpopulation for everything does nothing but distract us from the real problems that we actually have. Think about it. I want to make two points about food. The first is that Stein B.A., who is the chief agronomist of the Food and Agriculture Organization, which is part of the United Nations system, it's based in Rome, Italy, said a couple of years ago that using current agricultural technology that we could feed 14 billion people. Currently, we have 7 billion people. We're never going to reach 14 billion people. So there's no global shortage of food. There are still areas where people go to bed hungry every night. But let me make a second point. The worst famine in human history was not caused directly by a shortage of food. It was caused by government mismanagement of the economy. I'm talking about China in 1960, from 1960 to 1962. A couple years earlier, Chairman Mao, Mao Zedong, the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, had forced all of China's farmers into large agricultural collectives called People's Communes. Their land was taken away from them and given to the state. These People's Communes had populations of anywhere from 10,000 to 80,000 people. I was living in one of them in 1979, had about 80,000 people. Party cadres were given control over agricultural production. Party cadres who in many cases had no idea how to farm. The result was a disaster. People were told that they no longer had to worry about storing food in their homes because they would be eating at communal kitchens. In 1960, the food ran out in the communal kitchens and they were sent home to starve. And Mao Zedong made it even worse. He could have made it better. He could have made it better by announcing to the world that the people's communes had failed and asking the great grain producing, food producing countries of the world, countries like Canada, Australia, the United States, New Zealand, to send help and we would have responded generously. Instead, he hid the problem and in fact made it worse by sending the army into the countryside to collect the last stores of grain from starving peasants. He did that because he didn't want the guys with the guns to get too hungry. Dictators, of course, are often deposed when the army turns against them. So he wanted to make sure his army was well fed. He wanted to make sure the people living in cities were not starving to death in large numbers because that's where his offices and the offices of senior Communist Party officials were located. And he left people in the countryside to starve. 42 and a half million people starved to death in China from 1960 to 1962 because of Chairman Mao and the Chinese Communist Party's mismanagement of the, the agrarian sector of the economy. Worst famine in human history, not caused by overpopulation, caused by a callous disregard for human life and the laws of economics. And that story could be repeated again and again. Let's go to the next, the next little YouTube video. We'll talk about 
how many children we need to have to keep the population at current levels and why the population is going to be falling in the future. From the time of the cavemen all the way until today, humanity continues to exist because each generation of people has produced another generation to replace itself. Scientists have figured out how many people need to be born each generation to replace the generation before. That number is one person per person. All things being equal, this creates perfect demographic balance. Since women are the only ones who can have children, replacing every person on Earth means each woman needs to have two children, one to replace her and the other to replace the man who cannot have children. The total fertility rate is the average number of children each woman in a society is having. This number shows us if a society is growing or shrinking. In developed countries, the replacement rate birth rate is 2.1 children per woman. This will keep the population stable, but even that is assuming that every woman has children and that there are no wars, famines, or disease. In the real world, disasters happen all the time, and sadly not all children reach adulthood especially in poor countries. This pushes their replacement rate up to 3.3 children per woman. Since not every woman wants to have children, in order to keep the population stable, some women need to have more than 2.1 children to balance the birth rate with the women who are only having one or no children at all. Maintaining this balance is of the utmost importance. If society does not at least replace itself every generation, human numbers begin to fall exponentially. Economic and social problems appear, as elderly people retiring begin to outnumber young people entering the workplace. This is already happening all over the developed world. Many of the world's nations are only barely replacing themselves, while a growing majority have birth rates below replacement, some as low as 1.8 or even 1.2 babies per woman. Many societies are facing a very real danger. Extinction. All of Europe is dying. Everything from Catholic Ireland in the West to European Russia. Countries are losing population from year to year. I was in Moscow a few months ago. Russia is losing about three quarters of a million people from its population each year. Italy, Spain are dying countries. When I say a dying country, I mean that literally. I mean they're filling more coffins than cradles each year. In the hospitals, they're closing down maternity wards in Europe and they're opening up geriatric clinics. They're closing down factories that make toys and, and, and clothes for children and uh, uh, opening up uh, uh, graveyards for the large numbers of people who are going to be buried now and in the future. This is a sad thing and it's not limited to Europe. Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, many countries around the world, industrial countries are literally dying. Japan's population is shrinking from year to year as well. We have more than half the countries of the world now having too few children. The people are having too few children to maintain the current population, and over time their populations will shrink and die. I don't have time to go into detail about this, but I just want to make one point. The only place in the world where people are still having fairly large numbers of children on, on average is sub-Saharan Africa. And the reason they're still having large numbers of children in sub-Saharan Africa is not because they're breeding like rabbits, it's because they're still dying like flies. The mortality rates for children, infants and children in Africa is still very high. The average African woman has four children because she knows that two of her children will probably die before they reach adulthood. And she wants to have at least two children reach adulthood. And so I tell the UN Population Fund, I, tell Bill, I have told Bill Gates, they need to put their money into reducing infant and child mortality don't put their money into promoting abortion, sterilization, and contraception. Put it into reducing infant and child mortality if you're concerned about uh, the, the high birth rates because that's what's driving it. Let's go on to the next slide, the next YouTube video. Seven billion people. At some point in the year 2011, the Earth will hold seven billion people on its surface, more people than any point in recorded history. While some welcome this latest member of humanity with excitement, others with fear. When people hear that we've been adding 1 billion people every 15 years, they imagine humanity's growth to look something like this. But 1 billion people isn't as high a percentage of humanity as it used to be. For instance, imagine this roller coaster car represents 1 billion people. If we add another car, or 1 billion more people, our train has doubled in length. 
But if we want to double the train again, we can't just add one more train car. We'd have to add two. Every time we make the train longer, one train car represents a smaller and smaller percentage of the train. If it takes 15 years to add each new train car, then mathematically speaking, the growth rate is slowing. In order for the growth rate to stay constant, the train would have to keep doubling every 15 years, instead of just adding one car. Human population growth is the same way. In 1804, the world's population hit 1 billion. By 1927, that number had doubled. But by 1960, that number had only grown by half. By 1975, it was only growing by a third, and then a fourth, and then a fifth. To see how population growth is slowing down, we look at a number called the Global Total Fertility Rate, which is the average number of children each woman is having. And over the last 40 years, that rate has been rapidly falling. According to the UN's current data, the world's population is due to peak in 25 years. After it peaks, it will start to go down. By the end of the century, we'll be losing 1 billion people every 20 years. This year, the world's population will hit 7 billion. In 75 years, we'll be back here again. Think about it. In 75 years, we'll be back there again, only we will be older and grayer. We held last fall a press conference at the National Press Club on the day that the UN Population Fund announced that the population of the world was reaching 7 billion. We were there to celebrate this fact. And I, of course, I understand that not everyone uh, is happy that the planet is home to 7 billion people, but what is there not to celebrate? By nearly every measure of well-being, from infant mortality to life expectancy to educational level to caloric intake, life on planet Earth has been getting dramatically better. Let's talk about lifespans. You know, in 1800, when there were only 1 billion people on the planet, lifespans hovered around 24 years. That's how long people lived on average. By 1927, we reached 2 billion. A person could expect to live into their 40s. Today, as we pass the 7 billion mark, lifespans have reached 69 years and are still climbing. That's the average lifespan on the planet. Every month that goes by, lifespans lengthen by about a week. Now, think about this. As, as people live longer, naturally, there are more of us around at any given time. In fact, one reason why the population of the world doubled from three to six billion after World War II to the year 2000 in those 50 years, one reason for this doubling was lifespans went from the, the 40 years to almost 70 today. Again, as we're living longer, naturally there are more of us around at any given time. That's something we should celebrate, not something we should despair over. Better health care and nutrition, uh, crop yields continue to go up, incomes have soared, uh, I could go on, but, uh, but I have been told to, to, to come to the end. So let me, let me come right back to the point that I began with. The question was, is the world overpopulated? The answer, I believe, is a resounding no. Uh, there is plenty of room on God's green earth for all of us. And how could there not be? Let's look at this through the eyes of faith. Let's understand that this world, this planet, was created by an omni omniscient and omnipotent God who knew how our needs and numbers would grow over time. A God that would preposition in the world the resources that we would need as our numbers grew, resources that we could unlock with our creative God-given intelligences as our numbers grew resources like sand on the beach that we're now making into silicon chips that help us to communicate faster and store information more readily and do computations faster. You know, human beings have enough sense not to overstock a fish tank. Surely God, who at the beginning of time knew how our needs and numbers would grow, would have given us a planet sufficient to that growth and those needs. So I do not believe that there is overpopulation on planet Earth, nor do I believe that there is any overpopulation problem in heaven. Because after all, did our Lord not tell us there are many mansions in my Father's house? And is it not our job as Catholic Christians to be generous in welcoming new life into the world so that we can fill those mansions? 
Thank you very much.